So a quick overview of the Global Food Studies Program. You might ask what it is. Um, if you haven't heard of it before, it's potentially because it's relatively new in the faculty. Um, we joined the faculty in January of 2013. Um, they brought us over, there were Randy Stringer, Professor Randy Stringer and I were down at the Wake campus, but we we're economists working down there. And since that time we've expanded, so it's now about 12 academic PhD level people. Um, we have about 12 PhD students and we have a, um, a coursework master's progr program called Global Food and Agricultural Business that launched in 2010. And this year we have students from about 27 different countries in that program, so we're quite excited about that. Um, our team, almost all of us have experience um, working on some aspect of food production or agriculture production or even post-harvest. So our latest addition is someone who specializes in post-harvest. Um, so after um, understanding issues after food leaves the farm gate. Um, we, we have, like I said, backgrounds in agricultural food and resource economics, agribusiness, consumer behavior, value chain analysis, um, trade. I mentioned the food value chain. Basically what I mean by that is that we're looking at everything from input suppliers, so people providing fertilizer or seeds, to the farmers, um, to people um, wholesaling. So working as traders or brokers between farmers, getting things to markets, getting things to food processors, um, whether that be a multinational or a local processor, um, to retailers, multinational retailers, small retailers, um, to right down to the consumer. So we really take a systems approach in our research. We work very much with all the different sciences, everything from food safety, to um, we increasingly working with people at the Women's and Children's Health Research Institute, um, and we continue to work with people down at the weight. So the work we do requires an interdisciplinary approach, not just from the business and, and economics and social science side of it, but also in, including the hard science or the, the um, agricultural and food scientists, as well as health scientists. So we also have to account for social issues, environmental issues, um, governance and policy issues. So when I say a systems approach, a value chain approach, this is just kind of to give you some background on what I mean by that. So when we talk about what we do, we say our research is to focus on or help develop efficient food systems and food policy. So sometimes we're working with the private sector to solve a private sector issue, um, but most of the time we're working on issues related to food policy. So everything from improving the translation of the wonderful research that's done at places like the Weight Research Institute um, or at the Women's and Children's Health Research Institute and wondering why farmers, helping um, determine why farmers don't adopt some of that technology or why consumers um, aren't taking on board some of the recommendations um, in terms of health and, and diet recommendations. And Oftentimes, we're evaluating whether or not there's a role for government to play and the most efficient way for government to step in and, and intervene and have a policy if there's something called a market failure, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the other thing that we're increasingly doing a lot of is looking at the impact of different programs, whether that means um, agricultural development programs in, in our countries around the region or um, research investment in different areas. So looking at the economic impact. So I would say as our food system transforms and is transitioning and changing, and I'm going to talk about those changes in a minute, there's actually much more of a need for food policy and potentially government intervention. And this is potentially in a way different than how we used to see the government intervene in agricultural and food policy 20 or 30 years ago where at that time it was more focused on agricultural policy to deal with producer issues, to help out producers, to make sure that we kept our producers in business because that was the big food security issue. Um, so increasingly we're looking at issues where the government may need to think about policy and partner sometimes with the private sector. Increasingly we're seeing public-private partnerships in policies, things like food standards, um, and increasingly there's linkages because of international trade across governments, um, so global governance. So increasingly we're seeing a, a need for a different type of food policy, global food policy to some extent. And so we say that as economists we tend to say the only time the government should ever intervene in any market 
is if there's something called a market failure and the, the benefits from government intervention outweigh um, the cost to society from that market failure. And I just want to talk about, to give you some background on what we mean by market failures. So one of the first ones is we have something called a public good. So some examples related to food systems might be food security, food safety, and I'll give a definition of what I mean by food security in a couple of slides. But the idea behind a public good is that there's a need for the government to step in and intervene because no private firm has the incentive to provide enough for the public. So an example, a common example is defense, defense force. Um, that's usually provided through the government or through um, public dollars. That's an example. Externalities. Um, increasingly we're seeing externalities or concerns about externalities in the food system. This is, this is um, basically an unintended or, or a side effect of production or consumption that basically we're not paying the true price of in the market. So an example might be pollution, carbon sequestration, um, runoff, in, runoff from production because of overuse of fertilizer, salinity, um, climate change is an example of a potential externality. Another one people might not think about that comes from our own consumption is the impact that obesity has on society. So the costs that are borne to society because of people overconsuming or eating food that leads to health issues or health concerns. Non-communicable diseases which are on the rise, so things like diabetes and heart disease. Um, those potentially could be called an externality. Then there's issues that have been on the news a lot, it seems like, in Australia related to the food sector around market power. So concerns all the time about what the two largest food retailers are doing um, with respect to exhibiting buying power on their suppliers, for example, the milk case, the eggs case, in terms of the stipulations they put on, um, they put on the producers or the people selling them goods. Um, oftentimes we're also concerned about market power when prices are too high. So a few years ago when Microsoft got accused of having a monopoly in terms of selling the computer technology, there's been the same concerns when we have really concentrated food markets, what impact that has on food prices for consumers. So there's concerns in Australia, for example, about market power because we have the most concentrated or second most concentrated food retailing sector in the world. Um, then finally, something called asymmetric information. And I think the best way to think about this is if we think about organic or production related food attributes. Increasingly, we know demand for organic, for cage free, um, for free range, all of these types of attributes, even things related to fair trade, um, to provenance, um, all of those production related credence attributes in food are becoming increasingly important. Now anyone can take a food product and slap a sticker on it and say that it's organic. So there's a potential to provide consumers with misleading information if there's not some sort of governance and certification or standard system supporting those types of credence attributes in food. So that's just one example, but we're concerned about those things as economists if consumers are being misled or if someone in the food chain is being misled. It also happens on the on the production side too, where farmers don't always know the quality of the products they're selling and they could get taken advantage of. Um, for example, they might be selling a really high quality product and their buyer may know that, but they're not paying them a price that's representative of the quality that, um, that they, the quality relative to the average of the market. So I would say increasingly there's a need for a different type of food policy, a, a type of food policy that probably hasn't existed or or um, really, it, it differs from that food and agricultural policy that we saw in the 60s and 70s. Um, and it has to do with the way the markets are transforming. Okay, the other thing that I think is really important, and it relates to this food policy, it relates to what's happening in our food system, is something I call the global food system paradox. And I'll explain what I mean. First of all, we know particularly over the last five years, there's been a massive concern about food security. And I think oftentimes people don't understand what food security means. And it's quite interesting because um, probably over the last, since the 1990s, the, the international definition um, that basically I got this different definition from the FAO, it's kind of evolved. It used to be that when all people at all times have access to sufficient food, 
basically. But basically in the last five years, a few more words have been added. So we're now saying, seeing safe and nutritious food. So it's not just about having enough calories. It's actually concerns about the safety of food, the nutrition of the food. We know that people aren't necessarily food secure if they're living off of Coca-Cola and getting enough calories. It's about the nutrition, and that's increasingly concerned. And the other thing that's been added recently, really in the last three years, has been that word food preferences. So sufficient, safe, and nutrition, nutritious food that meets dietary needs and food preferences. So that food preference issue has been brought in. And that really has to do with the, the concerns about GMO, where we know that there's certain cultures that don't want to consume GMO, whether you're for or against it. And so this is supporting the notion that we can't force GMO on people, our genetically modified food. And there's really four dimensions. So a lot of people think that there's not enough food out there, that there's not enough food available. There actually is, even in the, the food price crisis, or the food crisis of 2007, 2008, and really around 2009, there was plenty of food available globally. The issue had to do with distribution systems, with political instability, with people having access to food, and also people utilizing food properly. And then there's recently been a fourth dimension added to this that has to do with stability over time, that we know with increasing trade, with freer trade, that we're seeing more volatility and variability in prices as some of those agricultural policies have been removed. And I just want to show some examples here about what I mean by a paradox. A paradox. Basically, we have concerns about people not having enough food and not having quality of food. So this is an example I took earlier this year on my first visit to the, to the northwestern provinces of Vietnam. This little boy, believe it or not, is 12, potentially 13 years old. And so he has fairly severe stunting because of his nutrition. And interestingly, his family produces a large amount of fruits and vegetables that the nutrition, the dietitian on our project would argue that if the family would incorporate more of their actual produce into their family diet, this wouldn't be an issue. So they have plenty of access, but they're using it to gain income so that they can send their kids to school. But there's a stunting issue. At the same time, we have massive issues, and sometimes even in the same household, where you have someone that isn't getting enough food, not getting enough um, of the nutrients, and they're at the same time severely obese. So the example I always use here, and Wahida, who was here with, who was on the trip with me in Indonesia, in Surabaya, the most obese child, who I think was about two or three that I've ever seen in my life, was actually in this really high-end hotel in Surabaya, and um, he was so incredibly, he looked quite a bit like the little boy up there sucking on the Coca-Cola thing. It was quite concerning. And then you walk out the door of this hotel, and the skinniest, most malnourished child I'd ever seen in my life was out on the street too. So we have this paradox of undernourishment, obesity, non-communicable diseases. And so at the same time that we're seeing um, the number of undernourished people, that's what the, the table on the left-hand side is showing, or the figure on the left-hand side is showing, is that undernourishment is going down. I think there's about 800 million people that are considered undernourishment. Um, it really varies from region to region, but actually just in our back door in Southeast Asia and South Asia is some, where some of the largest share of undernourished people um, are actually living. So Africa, Southeast Asia, and Eastern Asia, if you can't read those figures, is where the largest share of undernourishment is happening. And so we have obesity issues, non-communicable disease issues, um, we have undernourishment issues, and then we have this massive diversity in market, food market transformation. And this, these pictures I'm going to show you were taken within a block of each other, within a city block of each other. So this is a, this is a um, transitional um, fruit and veg market that sets up in this community um, where they're constantly getting pushed out by the police, but it was massive in terms of that whole block was filled up with people retailing food. A lot of the people selling this food had come in from peri-urban areas and they're growing it in gardens, and there's a big demand for this. People follow this group of, of traders around and sometimes farmers. So just some same, same place, same market, that lady was actually a farmer um, showing some of the quality. And just on the same block 
is a modern retail center. And this is in Hanoi, actually. And I took these in February of this year. And this is on the same block again. This is a specialty store that specializes in, is, specializes in selling clean vegetables, certified clean vegetables. So vegetables that have guarantees about their pesticides. Are they supposed to have government approved um, guarantees about lower pesticide use? And that's an interesting story about whether or not they really are lower in pesticide use. But they're government certified as being clean. So I want to quickly talk about some of the big demand forces. So as economists, we tend to think about the two sides of the market, the demand side of the market and the supply side of the market. And things are happening on both sides of the market that are driving transformation and affecting us as consumers. So I'll talk about some general global trends. So some of these you're probably well aware of. We're seeing a declining share of disposable income on food. So in some places, consumers in some countries, in the US, we spend less than 10% of our income on food. Less than 10% of our disposable income on food. I think the last figure I saw for Australia was between 10 and 15% in Australia of our disposable income is spent on food. Now, someone like me that's a bit of a foodie and is interested in things, I potentially spend a bit more. There's an increasing desire for variety and convenience foods. So we want more diverse foods. We might want cheeses from France or wine from South America, um, whatever, just variety and convenience. We don't want to eat the same old things. There's increasing concerns about the healthfulness and food safety. And what healthfulness means, every different person in here would probably have a different definition of what you perceive to be healthy. And then food safety, for obvious reasons. There's increasing concerns about social impacts of food systems, the impact on the environment, the impact on animal welfare, the impact of workers, maybe in Australia or in a foreign country. That's what fair trade is really about. Um, so social impacts of food systems. We're seeing those are credence attributes in foods related to the production processes, how it affects um, the production system. The other big thing we're seeing that I just got back from a trip to China. Um, got back, I was there for la most of last week, and we just kept hearing when we were talking to different um, people in the food sector about what impact the aging of their population was having. Again, we're working with another industry board here in Australia, and they're really focused on dealing with Australia's aging population and thinking about that market. So it's having a big impact on the food system. Ethnicity. We know that in our own country, in Australia, we're seeing increasing ethnic diversity. And so that brings new foods in and new needs and, and for example, increasing demand for halal food. Um, more travel and exposure. Um, E-commerce. This is another interesting thing. Um, anyone that's from China in here, I know there's a couple of people that are from China can verify this. And Xiaobo, who was on the trip with me last week, who's in here, I think, somewhere, what we kept hearing about was how much more and more food is being sold through e-commerce. And it's not just, you know, initially I think we think it's, it's baby formula because of the big food safety concerns there have been with baby formula. And we've heard stories about people taking in suitcases full of baby formula into China because there's so many concerns about the, the safety of baby formula. Um, and now there's limits on how much you can bring into China. But actually there's now growing, and, and we've really seen this grow massively since 2013, since these food safety issues, in e-commerce of all kinds of foods. So the Chinese, there's three or four different versions, websites that do this, the Amazon type um, commerce, e-commerce retailers that are focusing on having a certain amount of sales on food. And it's not just processed food, it's fresh food. Fruit. So if you just Google it, you see stories about importing or buy, being able to buy cherries from the United States, um, buying pork, and I know Australian um, food companies are getting increasingly interested in it. Um, the other big one that's affecting demand, and it's definitely a demand force, is biofuels. Now, I won't go too far into this, but there's mixed evidence to show how much biofuels are really affecting food demand, but it is something to think about. Then there's a couple of things that I want to separate out more into less developed countries. So I think everyone hears about this growing population, concerns about the boom in population of 9 billion people by 2050. So obviously, the more people we have, the more food we're going to need to feed all of those people. 
but the large share of that population growth is actually in our region and in Africa. So it's affecting areas where right now there's fairly low incomes. So in terms of declining share of disposable income on food, in developing countries or less developing countries, we're also seeing increasing disposable income. So I read something and heard when we were in China that there's now, or in the next five years, there's expected to be 650 million middle income consumers in China. That's more than double the US population. That's pretty crazy. Middle income consumers that have similar standard of living to us as middle income consumers. So urbanization, I'm gonna show and talk a little bit more about that. Increasing amount of urbanization, a larger share of people living in urban areas um, and that's not always for countries like Beijing or like China. It's not always the Beijings um, and the Shanghais. We're seeing increasing um, growth of what's called second and third tier cities. And then a major thing affecting our food systems and demand for food and supply systems is dietary upgrading in these developing countries. And that means an increasing demand for protein, so a big demand for beef products, poultry, um, pork, that require grain or maize, or inputs that are used for other, other types of food consumption. So that's really changing the system. And also increasing demand for fruits and vegetables. So a lot of the work we've been doing in Indonesia is finding out that we're seeing people that usually rotated mostly rice, maybe another crop, are now shifting into a rice horticulture crop rotation and shifting out of the other crops, but we're seeing increasing shifting in, in Asia, particularly into production of fruits and vegetables because they offer cash opportunities. So urbanization, what does this mean? What's the impact of this? Basically, I just wanna to point to a few things here. If you look at the rates of urbanization from 1990 to 2000 to 2000 and 12 in countries like Malaysia, China, Indonesia, and Laos. It's pretty incredible the rates of growth. So if you look at China and Indonesia, roughly you had in China around 25% of the people living um, in Malaysia is getting very close to Australia and the US in terms of the share of people living in, in urban areas. So what does this mean? And I just, basically what we're looking at is by region, what's happening. And so if you look at the red, that's what's happening with rural population. So these are millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, sorry. I know, millions of people is what this is representing. So it's not only showing the growth in population, but where that population is. So red is rural and blue is urban. So we're seeing in places like East Asia and China, soon um, there's more people living in urban areas than in rural areas. Well, what does that mean? You have growing populations, people shifting out of agriculture into urban areas. They require different food because their incomes are going up. They demand more diverse diets, more meat, more fruits and vegetables, and boom, what is also happening is we're having fewer people producing food. So now you have people out in the agricultural areas that maybe aren't as focused on the long-term investment in that agriculture. And so you're seeing agricultural production, in some cases, overuse of chemicals, um, fertilizers and herbicides, and maybe less efficient production practices. So disposable income's going up. And I just put this up, I'm just showing you basically the US, Australia, and the EU are you know, really high relative to our less developing countries. So places like the Philippines, Vietnam, China, Indonesia are all down here, and we're seeing growth, particularly since about 2005, but let's look at it in a different way, where we get rid of the EU and Australia. So again, right now, that's per capita income, per house, so per capita income in those countries that we showed before. So relative to the developed world, the US, the EU, um, it's very low. But if you look at the change that's happening, so Brazil, um, Thailand, China, Indonesia's down here. It's, the change is really happening, and I mentioned that 650, the middle class, is really growing in these places. The other thing we're seeing, I mentioned dietary upgrading. I just want to show you an example. If you look in Asia, for example, the orange here, the orange is, is um, animal source foods, and you see the change across income. So this is basically the lowest quintile of income, Q1, and the highest quintile of income. So we know as incomes grow, diets are going to continue to shift, 
and we're gonna see increase in, in animal source foods, the fats and oils, which is here, which is quite shocking in some places, and sugars, again, which is quite concerning and shocking. And if you look at processed foods, basically the red is our cereals, and then the next one is starchy roots. We're seeing declines in cereal crops. Um, last week when I was in China, I don't think we had rice once, um, which is quite interesting. And again, food safety concerns. I think in Australia we're pretty lucky. Since I've, I've lived here about eight years, and I think there's, I don't ever remember there being a massive food safety outbreak. Relative to just the other day in the United States, there was a big E. coli outbreak in beef where a large share of beef was recalled. So, but what's safe? What's healthy? People really don't know. Mixed perceptions. And so we're seeing this increase in demand for certifications. And interestingly, when we do consumer research, um, we see some people that they'd be willing to pay for any kind of certification. If we look at what motivates their behavior in food, if it's got a certification on it, even if it's a meaningless one, they'll pay more for it, they'll trust it more, and they, they think it's a better product, even though that certification may be absolutely meaningless. This is something that has me really concerned, particularly in Australia. I used to spend a lot of time doing work on this in the United States, on setting up the USDA organic, on setting up the standard in the US for, for free range, on setting up the standard for natural. So when we were setting up standards, there's a standard that says that if you want to have something labeled as organic, it has to be fit under the USDA certified organic program or the USDA free range or the natural. And there's standards that say these are what these things mean, regulated at the government level. In Australia, there's none of that. Now, not only is there none of it, but, but basically the regulation of food labeling and food um, basically, yeah, marketing of food comes down to the states. Now, we have to think about the costs versus the benefits of changing that system, but when we do work with consumers here, um, I see a lot of misunderstanding um, about what these different attributes mean. And it's quite concerning because that, that uh, market failure of asymmetric information, it definitely exists with labeling of these credence attributes. Um, and I can talk more about that. But these credence attributes aren't just of concern to the developed world. So Australia, the United States, Europe. These are pictures I took in Beijing just last week where we have organic chicken, organic milk. Um, this is, these are pictures that we took on different trips in Bogor, West Java with um, my PhD student Wahida that's here. Um, so I need to thank her for some of these. So different um, organic, hybrid, pesticide-free marketing claims that we see in a very high-end supermarket in Bogor. Um, yeah, just basically low pesticide use. I'm not sure how well it's showing up there. GAP certified, organic healthy rice. We're seeing these everywhere. And even in this wet market, this was the thing that when we were doing this organic project in Indonesia, we thought was so cute in a way that we're even seeing labeling of organic food products at the traditional markets in um, Surakarta, Indonesia. And then when we asked the, the trader there, the person selling that, um, you know, how they knew that it was organic, suddenly they didn't want to talk to us anymore. Um, we were more just interested in if they were working as some sort of cooperative. So that's all demand side forces. But partially driven by those demand side forces and partially driven by other things going on, we're having supply side forces that are really restructuring those food markets. So we know because of, of um, growing incomes, that need for diversity in our diet, that we're seeing increasing trade of food, increasing globalization. Because of opportunities for um, multinational food companies to make money in places like Indonesia, China, Asia, Africa, Latin America, we're seeing increasing foreign direct investment. Um, and these systems are increasingly having to compete on cost, on price. They've got to be efficient. So we see efficiency, the need for the systems to have better distribution systems that are low cost. Um, we're seeing that lead to vertical coordination to match the quality um, to the demand and to be able to source that with, um, from, from the producers. And we're seeing consolidation of firms all over the place in the food sector where we're seeing um, global consolidation of of everything from the input suppliers to the food retailers um, to the food processors. Probably more at the input supplier and food processor side than at the food retailing side. 
So all of these things we're talking about, this globalization of food, um, has led to a new type, a need for a new type of food policy that we do a lot of work on, looking at global governance of food systems. So how we set up certifications. So there's something called ISO, the international, it's an international board that looks at governance to some extent of food safety systems, HACCP for example. There's an increasing need for traceability of food systems. And at the same time all of that's happening, we're having something that's quite concerning to us as economists, that we're seeing decreasing public investment in agricultural and food research and development. And interestingly, where a lot of that money that used to go in, in, in soils that are saline um, or to deal with drought tolerant varieties or create drought tolerant varieties, we had public investment in that. Increasingly, increasingly, particularly in the developed world, we're seeing that investment shifting to the private sector and away from the public sector. And instead, the public sector money that was once there is now being shifted into health research because we have all these growing health concerns or it's decreasing altogether. And then climate change, which again, some people still don't believe, my dad being one of them, interestingly. Supermarket share of retail food sales. This is really changing food systems in places like Indonesia, in places like China, where as multinational supermarkets come in, they need to reduce their risks. Part of how they compete is not just on cost, so it's about, it's about distribution systems and sourcing systems that are very low cost, but it's also about distribution systems that guarantee that they are able to sell high quality food and food that is safe. So they're not just competing against competing on cost, but they're competing to some extent on saying that they offer safer food or better quality food. And we're seeing um, as, as multinationals move into the Tesco's, the Kroger's of the world, move in, the Walmart's of the world, move into places like Asia, Africa, and Latin America, that that's really changing how um, people do business in terms of food marketing in those countries. And I'll talk, I'll talk about an example of that in a minute. So this is just showing how it's going up. Just showing globalization, I just always think this is funny. The first time I went to Indonesia, I was, it was not too long after I moved from the United States. And in this traditional market, very traditional market, I was very surprised when I, we went to the apple sector to see that um, there was Washington State apples being sold there. So to me, that's a good example of globalization. Another example, this is from actually a U.S. report, but this just shows the well-traveled salad and shows all the different places, probably less so in Australia, but most countries would look similar to this, just all the different places the different components of that salad might come from. And if you think about the salad dressing, so if you're concerned about the origin of your food or the provenance of your food, um, you might need to really be thinking about being willing to pay more. And so food safety issues. I just put up several of the different food safety issues. Um, so we know about issues with E. coli. We know there's concerns about GMO. And increasingly, we're seeing concerns about the authenticity of the food, um, about concerns about additives, um, food, um, things in food that cause allergens. So on my flight back from Beijing, um, we got stuck on the tarmac for about three hours, and, and the guy next to me really was hungry and wanted some peanuts. And he had a meltdown because they couldn't give out peanuts because um, there was someone on the plane that had a severe allergy to peanuts, and so there could be nothing with peanut products in there. So that's just an example of how big some of these food safety issues are. And traceability. This is an example of a multinational food retailer that we don't have in Australia called Metro. Some of you may have heard of it. And this is an example of a traceability system they're doing where for horticulture products they have basically farm to fork traceability systems that they're doing as a point of differentiation. And I just put this slide in to show one of the examples of food retailing, of e-commerce retailing in China. Um, now I'm just going to shift gears here and, and hopefully fairly quickly show you two examples of the type of research we do. I've mentioned several times a study, a project we've been doing for several years in Indonesia. This project was funded by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, but we had several partners both in country in Indonesia and um, in the United States, so the International Food Policy Research Institute, which really very few people there are actually Americans. There's people from all over the world working there. Now, this, you might say, well, what's the relevance to me? So it shows, I want to show to you how supermarkets are impacting the food system. I think oftentimes we tend to think that supermarkets are bad. 
So this is maybe the good, bad, and the ugly of supermarkets and showing how it impacts markets in food systems in Indonesia. So supermarkets are often a double-edged sword. So there's concerns when supermarkets are multi, it could be hypermarkets, it could be metro, it could be Walmart, or it could just be um, a large-scale supermarket that's maybe even owned domestically. In Indonesia, for example, some of the retailers that were cared for that was once owned by, by the French is now owned domestically, I believe, or maybe by a Malaysian company, I can't remember. But there's concerns when they come in that those, those, those food retailers are going to crowd out traditional food retailers because they're going to provide things like better quality food, cheaper food, safer food. Um, the, when we crowd out those traditional retail markets, that it may also crowd out small farmers. So we know that those retailers need these efficient distribution systems. They need quality standards to be met. Um, they need to reduce their transaction costs. So there's concerns that small farmers may be squeezed out. Interestingly, that example I show of Metro, that is actually an example of, of a multinational that's specifically focused on incorporating or bringing in small farmers because they're using that as part of their marketing in, in China, that they're supporting small farmers. However, it's not just bad. We know from our own research, and I won't talk too much about this, but that sometimes these multinationals, when they're willing to work with the small farmers, they can provide the small farmers with capacity building, with access to inputs, seeds, with access to credit, technical assistance, um, so that they can meet higher standards. And we know that from our own research that sometimes that increases their profits by as much as 30%. But there's very few people, for example, in Indonesia, our farmers, that are actually getting into doing that because there is still much still so much traditional markets. We also know that from research around the globe that when supermarkets come in that we see diet and nutrition transition. Positive things are increasing diet diversity, sometimes introduction to more proteins, sometimes it's new fruits and vegetables. And in, in, in Indonesia, we're definitely seeing an introduction to more Mediterranean varieties of fruits um, and more so they're having an impact on the fruit side of things. We also know that supermarkets can offer increased food accessibility. Um, there's been a lot of work done on food deserts globally, where we know that when people, when, when there's not a supermarket near, that people may have poor diet quality. That's usually in the developed world, the United States particularly. But we also know that there's negative aspects. So that there's inequalities in food accessibility, depending upon the strategies of those supermarkets where they decide to locate. And we know that it often can lead to increased consumption of processed foods, which are often nutrient poor. And that can potentially be associated with obesogenic diets. So I'm going to go through this quickly because I think we're running out of time. And I'm just going to tell you the results. Basically, we looked at, we looked at where people in Indonesia shopped for food, what their shopping behaviors were, um, where they purchased food. And I think what I'll do, to, just to save time, I can show any of this during questions. What we found is basically that the evolution of food retailing in Indonesia is basically going to still be, it's going to be slow. That consumers in Indonesia are still highly dependent upon traditional food outlets because they believe in general that traditional food outlets provide them with more diversity, um, with fresher access to food particularly fruits and vegetables in their traditional food sources. And modern outlets, the people that shop there, tend to be consumers who are really concerned about food safety or concerned about quality attributes in credence queues and want only trust um, a multinational type of food retailer. So if we look at using, our, using, using the data we collect to do projections, we would basically say that over the next 10 years, um, food expenditures at modern outlets are still going to remain no more than one quarter of total food expenditures. So we're just not seeing the transition because in Indonesia, the traditional retailers have adapted and they're cleaning themselves up and doing, there's been food policy to help improve those. They're, they're um, upgrading, so they still provide an opportunity for farmers. In terms of diet transition, um, this is some work we've just recently done with the data based on the household food consumption patterns and their food expenditures. We do see a correlation, a significant correlation, even when we control 
for income and education um, with supermarket expenditures, a higher share of supermarket expenditures, and a diet that is considered more obesogenic. So if we regress um, BMI and, and look, at, look at households who have overweight and obese members, we tend to see that there's a positive association between higher um, expenditures at supermarkets and a pro higher probability of having a family member that's obese or overweight. So, and that's after controlling for other factors that we know. Now, I think I'm going to just quickly talk to this and show you a few things um, about this beef study. This is an Australian study that I just wanted you to show you how when we do research with Australian consumers and we try to find out um, what their perceptions are about different food attributes, credence attributes in food, we get some pretty concerning results. So this was using something called a discrete choice experiment where we basically simulate a retail setting and we vary things like price and um, these different credence attributes and even this was looking at steak. And so we create a scenario where basically we try to simulate the buying behavior that would happen if you were in a supermarket. And we present people with different pictures, and basically they choose which one they would buy, and they have an option to, to opt out of it altogether. And so just some quick summary things that I think are interesting and relevant. If we look at an attribute such as the National Heart Foundation, so I think most people in here have seen that, that red tick um, or the white tick on the red background at some point or another. Now, if you get on the Heart Foundation website, basically what... The, the website will tell you is that's telling you that this is a potentially a healthier choice. But if you look at what consumers think it means, basically um, more than 40% said they think it means a safer choice. It's got nothing to do with food safety. Um, they think, and, and yet there's less that think it actually means what it does. So that's quite concerning in terms of misinformation and information asymmetry. Um, and if we look at things like hormone and antibiotic free, so we put these claims on products, we didn't bias them in any way, they were to tick things that they thought it meant and in some cases add in if we missed anything. If you look at hormone and antibiotic free, um, some of the retailers are using this in their marketing. People think it has less food safety risks. Actually food safety risks should be the same. Um, if you look at grain fed beef, that's actually good. It's, grain fed beef can be associated with better quality and tender. Um, environmentally sustainable, um, that it's better for society, that it's raised in a more environmentally friendly manner. Um, again, picking on the hormone and antibiotic um, free beef, that people believe that it's better for their health. There's actually no evidence to support that. So if we look at claims and people, how that affects willingness to pay, the only ones that were significant in this study are actually Heart Tick MSA, which is actually Meat Standards Australia, which actually has a system behind it. It's quite a good program, I think, in terms of auditing. Um, so it's, it's actually positive to see that, that people were willing to pay a premium for that because it does improve quality. Um, but then this environmentally sustainable one, that's actually an attribute we made up. There's, we weren't using any existing program. We just created a slogan for it and put it on the beef products to see how it would affect. And that one has, aside from the health claim, um, which was that heart tick of an increased premium or value of 93 cents per kilo, the next one is this environmentally sustainable one um, of 34 cents. It means absolutely nothing, yet some consumers, it really increased their value, um, the value they placed on that food product, and it increased the probability of them being willing to buy that product. Interestingly, this was done in 2010, by the way, um, certified humane actually has a negative value. Okay, so these are average. So we had a representative sample of a thousand, roughly a thousand beef consumers in this study. So we actually oversampled in this more people than we needed, but it allowed us to actually do segmentation. And this is where I was talking about not just in this study, but other studies we've done. We see this segment that's about anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of the population, depending upon what product you're looking at. When it comes to products like meat or seafood where there's more risk associated, you see that segment grow. Where there's more people that if you just are sticking any certification, even if it's something like environmentally sustainable, they are more likely to pay a premium for that and they're more likely to choose that one and trust in it, even when those things are absolutely meaningless and not even things on the market. 
So just showing you how there's, there's actually a fairly um, large concern, I would say, about misleading information from marketing claims because of the food policy. Now again, we need to think about cost versus benefits of claiming, of changing that. So our consumer research findings, and that's not just from the beef study that I showed you very little of. This is from several studies we've done in Australia with different products. Um, we find that Australian consumers are really confused about the benefits of food claims. There's heterogeneity, and we do tend to see that consumers who are more knowledgeable about those and, and, and can show that they, they um, understand what different claims mean, whether it's nutrition claims or just simply production um, claims, that they do tend to, um, they do tend to understand what they're doing. Um, and it does tend to have a, the right effect on their food purchasing decisions. Um, but with respect to nutrition and health claims, there's a lot of cynicism we see from consumers, um, a lot of lack of trust, even in um, government agencies like the NHMRC, the National Health and Medical Research um, Center, and um, even from the CSIRO. Well, that's probably one of the more trusted ones our research would show. Um, and basically, as I, sh as I showed um, from the beef research, there's really a misunderstanding about what these credence attributes or credence claims, such as organic, such as free range, um, fair trade, really mean. People think that things like organic are safer, yet, for example, across the globe, some of the biggest food safety outbreaks have, um, have been in organic food products. So what does all this mean? What does it mean for the average consumer? We know food markets are transforming. They're changing a lot. We know globalization is happening. There's nothing we can probably do, the average Joe can do, to, to stop that. We know international trade is increasing. Part of that's driven by people that are just purely focused on getting inexpensive food, um, or people that want food from other countries um, because of their own backgrounds. Um, we know risks in food systems are changing. I actually don't know, I, I, I would not say that risks are increasing in food systems. I think what's happened is over time we have better technology to identify where the risks are coming from. It's pretty amazing when there's a food safety outbreak, for example, the, the, the sprout outbreak in Europe in 2011, how quickly they could trace that outbreak down and find the source of that food and keep more people from getting sick. Now that's simply because of the science and technology that didn't exist even five years ago, um, and particularly not ten years ago. So the way to track um, pathogens in food is really, really improving. And so we're going to catch more of those things because the technology has, has changed. S yeah, because we're trading more, there's certainly more things going around in the world. And things like avian influenza have the, have the potential to um, spread more quickly, but we're also able to control for those things um, as well because of the science and technology. Prices, we know because of trade, and, and I know that there's people from the in Institute for Trade in here um, that can probably add things on this, but we know that with increased um, free trade that we tend to see prices become more volatile over time. Now, that depends upon our sourcing systems and what's going on in terms of, of um, the, the production systems in different countries. But in terms of ag and food, we certainly have seen more price volatility over the last five years. Um, what all this means really is that your food may come from more distant locations. Okay, Your food is probably coming from more places and potentially more distant places. You may not even know about that. Now, country of origin labeling is required in Australia on most food products, so you can probably find out, but our research would show most people don't even pay attention to it, even if they say they do. In reality, when you look at their buying decisions and you look at it, how origin labels affect them, they're not paying any attention or very little attention. So as consumers, okay. we need to pay, if it's more expensive, are we willing to pay that price? Because at certain times of the year, to get those food products, it could be very, very expensive. For example, strawberries are a great example where if I want strawberries, sometimes, or blueberries, I think blueberries were 7 or $8 a kilo last night at the, st at the shop, and I decided not to buy them, but people are obviously paying for it. So it's obviously not season for those in Australia right now. What do we want to pay? Um, so we have to realize, I think, I gave a talk about a month ago at one of the South Australian food events, and I talked about the three Fs. So we have an increasing kind of foodie population, people that like to sit at dinner, dinner parties and talk about the provenance of their food or say that it's organic or say it's fair trade. And, 
And I'm into those things too, but when I'm sitting at a dinner party with some of my friends and I think about how clueless they are about what fair trade means or what organic means um, and how much they might have paid for those things, it's pretty concerning. And food sovereignty, meaning caring about um, our local food system, that's one of the definitions of it, um, versus food security. So by buying food locally, if you also care about supporting small producers and fair trade, there's, there's probably, they're antagonist things sometimes. So if I want locally produced food, it may not also mean that I'm, um, if I also care about fair trade, they don't necessarily go hand in hand. So as consumers, I think we all need to start being a little bit more um, aware and informed um, about our food decisions. And, and I'll even challenge the university a little bit. So I think recently the university said they were um, buying fair trade. And we know from doing work in places like Vanuatu that fair trade is not always um, good for smallholder farmers. And actually some of the certifications for things to be fair trade actually means that there's a large amount of small farmers, um, particularly farmers that aren't plantation farmers, they can't participate in those fair trade programs. But oftentimes people think by supporting fair trade that they're supporting those small farmers in developing countries. And that's not actually the case. Usually that's associated with plantation farming because the costs of certification for fair trade are just simply too expensive for a lot of farmers in a lot of countries to get in. That doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. You just need to be aware of what you're paying for. Again, I've mentioned several times organic and free range. There's, we're, we're starting a big animal welfare project and looking at perceptions of, of um, free range and what consumers think that free range means. And so free range does not mean that the welfare of animals is necessarily better. And so that's quite concerning to different agencies that are concerned about animal welfare. So those are the types of things I mean. So I think we have some time for questions. People are probably getting hungry though. So, um, so yeah, food for thought, I guess. Happy to take any questions.